This is The World According to Mark, your host, Mark Lieberman. And we're coming to you from WPBM FM LP in Asheville, North Carolina. And today I'm happy to welcome a return guest. Um, Michael, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Michael Maslanka, who is a professor of law. Uh, why don't I let you give your introduction, Michael? Sure. I'm, a, I'm actually an assistant professor of law uh, okay. here in Dallas at uh, UNT, that's the University of North Texas uh, at Dallas. Okay. And you are um, an expert in lots of things. You're a prolific writer. Uh, you've written for a number of law journals and been interviewed by a number of folks on everything from constitutional law, labor law, employment law, ethics, uh, lawyer ethics, I guess. Um, so you, your, your knowledge is, uh, is vast. It's vast. I like to think it's, 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 I know it's, I know it's broad. I like to think it's deep, but you, you can find somebody who disagrees with that part. But I don't, I, it's, somebody may just say it's, it's, it's thin, but I, I like to think it's vast and, and deep as well. But there, there could be a debate over that. So today we're going to um, try to m monopolize your time on a particular topic, and, but there may be other topics that uh, we'll get in. But what I really was struck by was that you had uh, written about something called qualified immunity, which uh, our listeners may not understand anything about that until we get into it. But let me just set the, the tone for it. Um, we have heard about qualified immunity in the news these days. Uh, most unfortunately, it keeps coming up in these cases of um, police brutality, I guess we should say police killings, um, particularly in communities of color, particularly in, in disadvantaged communities. And the list of, of folks who have um, lost their lives or been paralyzed and uh, worse. Well, I'm not sure what's worse than that, but paralyzed and the like, um, and spanning from uh, black communities, Asian communities, so on and so forth, um, where police have taken matters into their, um, into their own hands and um, an outcome perhaps that they might not have expected has occurred. And the question arises, um, to what extent are police who are officers essentially of the state uh, given more leeway in terms of their guilt or innocence, and I say that both criminally and civilly, than uh, you and I as, as normal ordinary citizens. So this, this concept of qualified immunity has come up in discussions and so who better to go to than you to discuss what all this really means? So where would you like to start, Michael? So let's start with history, okay? You know, I always tell my students that the lawyer who knows the rule and the reason for a rule always has an advantage in a legal firefight over the lawyer who just knows the rule. So let's talk about qualified immunity and where it comes from. It comes from the era of reconstruction after the Civil War. So the North wins the, wins the war, uh, Union troops occupy the South, but uh, nevertheless, the Ku Klux Klan raises up and they terrorize Black citizens in the South. And so in 1871, uh, Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act of 1871, which is often called the Ku Klux Klan Act. And in short, this is what it means, is that uh, the Black citizens, uh, or any citizen really, but it was designed to protect Black citizens, uh, can seek a, 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 a can file a lawsuit in a federal court if uh, an agent of the state, I'm not talking about a federal agent, but a state agent, violates their constitutional rights under the Bill of Rights. You know, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, uh, search and seizure, Eighth Amendment uh, uh, regarding imprisonment, and it empowered blacks to sue, uh, and was caused by the uh, by the Ku Klux Klan and their terrorizing of black citizens. That was in 1871. And it lay dormant. The law lay dormant for many, many, many years. 
and it popped up again in a case in the United States Supreme Court in 1961. That's a long span of time, as you indicated. C can I, let me ask you if I can ask you a question here. Um, it, you say uh, that it arose in connection with um, civil rights, by, or, or civil rights uh, violations. Well, constitutional violations of the rights of black citizens. Ah, okay, so, so okay, so the the inc any incident that occurred with the Ku Klux Klan or whatever. Um, first of all, Ku Klux Klan folks are just again everyday citizens and white supremacists. They're not creatures of the state. If a Ku Klux Klan person commits a atrocity, then you know, let's say it's murder or lynching, there is a criminal action that would, would, would rise for that, right. from that. There's a criminal action. What happened was, unfortunately, many uh, officers of law enforcement were members of the Klan. Uh, so that's where the state action comes in, an, an actor of the state. You know, you got, you got your badge, but it's under, under your white hood. Uh, and so that was the genesis of the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1871, and it was called the Ku Klux Klan Act. And so it was twisted together like a pretzel with uh, bad law enforcement officials in the South who were terrorizing, under the guise of the Klan, um, uh, Black citizens. Okay. So the, the Ku Klux Klan law, which is still, uh, at some form of it is still in existence today, was meant, presumably, to, to provide a right of action um, and to provide an additional deterrent to someone who was acting, um, who had a badge all yeah. under, under what you call color of state law. So then yeah. what happened, bring it back to what happened in the 60s then? So in 1961, remember, let's put this in some historical context. Brown versus the Board of Education, right? Uh, uh, schools will be integrated. Desegregation is against the law. That was 1953. So eight years later, the United States Supreme Court looked at a case. Some very smart lawyers, some very brave lawyers in Chicago sued police officers in Chicago. And what the police did was they, they busted into an apartment. It was a family, a husband, a wife, children. They had them all stripped naked uh, and essentially terrorized them. And it was an unlawful search and seizure, violated the Fourth Amendment. Um, and what the Supreme Court said was, you know what? Let's go back to 1871. And the argument was this, this action was a violation of the Ku Klux Klan Act. And it wasn't until 1960 when the United States Supreme Court said these were officers of the state, these were cops, and they should be able to be sued and held accountable under the Ku Klux Klan Act that was enacted back in uh, 1871. And that was the first time the Supreme Court gave its blessings to that kind of claim. Okay. So, so then going, going forward, um, this issue of qualified immunity somehow raised its, its head and what was the context of that? The, the context of it was a right was given, right? A right was given to um, uh, citizens to sue, um, um, and under, it's called actually section 1983. That's the, that's the term of art. So we, if I refer to section 1983, that's the, uh, the the name of the claim that's brought under the Ku Klux Klan Act. And so, so, so the courts, not Congress, right? Not Congress, because there's nothing about qualified immunity or any defense in section 1983, zero, totally silent. And nothing in the constitution about Nothing it. in the constitution, nothing. So out of whole cloth, the courts just decide, you know what, police officers have to make split second decisions. Um, and they shouldn't be liable individually. I'm talking about individual police officers now, not the city or the, or the county, whatever state agency they work for. Shouldn't be held accountable. So we're gonna give them what's called qualified immunity. So absolute immunity means you can't be sued. Qualified immunity means you're gonna be sued in certain circumstances. And the court, you know, the court said, as long as the actions of the officer were in good faith that they, you know, they didn't mean to violate the Constitution. It was a good faith action, albeit mistaken. 
they get qualified immunity. That was, oh, 1976. But then something happened and it wasn't good. And I'll tell you about it. The lower courts didn't quite understand how to define good faith. So what the lower courts did, they said, you know what? The police officers, if they take an action, we're gonna allow them to assert this defense of qualified immunity, which means you get off the hook. You're not sued, you win, case is over. If the conduct they engaged in had never happened before, bear with me here, because this is so incredible, really. If it had never happened before, if there were not police officers who engaged, who were engaged in the same kind of conduct, then you know what? We're going to give them a, a free, a, we're going to give them a pass because they didn't really have notice. And therefore, the police officers have qualified immunity. We're going to grant their motion for qualified immunity and we're going to throw the case out. Think about that for a second. It's astonishing to me. It, 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 it boggles, it, it is astonishing. It's exactly right. There's no, no other way to put it. And so, it, 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 you know, we, you and I talked a little bit off air before we, uh, before we started doing this. It presumes that police officers have do nothing else but sit around and read opinions from federal district courts and federal uh, appellate courts. You know, and it's so, and so claim after claim after claim, and there was a, a rush a few years ago to try to get the United States Supreme Court to look at these issues and to look at these uh, scenarios. There was a case where um, uh, it was in uh, Georgia where uh, police officers were chasing a suspect and the uh, police officers had their weapons, their firearms drawn, and they believed the uh, uh, person they were chasing had hidden under uh, a, 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 the, uh, oh, the porch of someone's home. And so they started to shoot, but you know what they, who they shot? They shot an 11 year old kid in the leg. And there was a 1983 lawsuit, it was excessive force, right? right? Excessive force, violation of the fourth amendment. And what the court of appeals said was, you know what? This has never happened before. They, they were on, you know, there's no way the police could be on notice uh, about something like this. So we're gonna give them a pass. Well, let, let me comment for a second, and you're the expert, but the, the way this feels ridiculous to me, I was going to use preposterous, preposterous, ridiculous is on the one hand, specific rights exist under the Constitution and various constitutional amendments, and also um, civil rights laws, which were enacted pursuant to um, the Constitution, and they, they were meant to try to uh, prevent police from and others from taking advantage of their position and, and uh, depriving uh, ethnic minorities, people of color, whatever, of their rights. But on the other hand, at the same time, the Supreme Court apparently in, in more recent times, but still, you know, what you're, what you're saying 1960 or so, they, the Supreme Court said, well, we're concerned that uh, police may not be properly uh, understanding of what, their, of what their responsibilities are. But some of that sounds bizarre. In other words, the, for example, I know in some of these recent cases which have been come up, there's questions been raised about can a police person, can a police person shoot someone in the back if they're running away from a crime scene? Or can they only use the weapon if they're concerned that the individual might hurt him or herself or hurt somebody else? And then there's the question about the whole George Floyd thing, which is you know uh, putting your knee on somebody's neck for uh, close to nine minutes. But it doesn't seem to me that the police need to know whether there was a case that was similar to that. They just need to know that they are using force, excessive force, and there's a bad outcome as a result of it. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, I, I'll put it a slightly different way, is that it's like a shell game, right? If you go, you, you go to the streets in New York City and have the shell game going on, is that citizens received a right back in 1871. 
but they don't have a remedy. Oh, you can sue, do whatever you want. Oh, if it's an excessive force, that's fine. You sue under Section 1983. They gave them a right, but under qualified immunity, as many courts, not, now, not all courts understand it the, the, the way I did, but all courts have a, have, have a similar uh, uh, interpretation. Oh, but if it never happened before, the police officer really wasn't on notice, and therefore you don't have a remedy. What you give with one hand, you take away with the other. And that's the absurdity in qualified immunity. Let me and I'll just, go ahead. Let me take the, the first moment to just look and reintroduce my guest. We're hearing from Michael Maslav Lanka, who's the assistant professor of law uh, at the University of Texas Dallas College of Law. If I've said that right, there's a lot of words there. And we're talking about qualified immunity. And before you just go one further step, um, Michael, uh, is the qualified immunity, quote, defense used in both criminal and civil actions? So it's a different, it's different. So section 1983 is a civil action for money damages. Now we see uh, uh, though a, a criminal action, which uh, you see under state law. So we see these ter this terrible incident in Atlanta uh, earlier this week um, is that, uh, 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 and we'll see whether it's a hate crime or not, but that individual who's in custody uh, 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 can be prosecuted uh, and you can also be prosecuted for uh, the murders, uh, but also it's enhanced through the concept of a hate crime. So you can have a parallel track. You can have civil litigation on one hand, and you can have a criminal prosecution uh, on the other, which is probably uh, going to be what you see in Atlanta. It's probably uh, what uh, was involved in the George Floyd case because it, it was last week, uh, the city of Minneapolis reached, uh, uh, I think a $27 million settlement with the estate of George Floyd. Now to be clear, the Atlanta case, as, as much as we know about it, was a, a murders that were committed by private a private citizen, whereas in the George right. Floyd case, so there was and, there'd be no section right. So there'd be no section 1983 claim there. That that that's right. There could be a civil uh, civil action based on state law. So that's right. So it wasn't a police officer. So there wasn't wasn't a um, um, a civil action under section 1983 as it would be in the Minneapolis case with George Floyd because there's a criminal prosecution there. But there's also a state actor, and the state actor uh, was uh, the police officer, former officer uh, Derek Chauvin. Um, and so that's where 1983 gets involved. That's correct. So in that criminal action in, um, against uh, the, the police officer who had his knee on the neck of George Floyd, is, do you, is there a defense that can be raised in the criminal action of, pertaining to qualified immunity or no, is that not, that's yeah, not there? Says, but the qualified immunity, this is a really important point. The qualified immunity only applies in a civil action under 1983 seeking monetary, essentially monetary damages for a violation of a constitutional right that's embedded in one of the Bill of Rights, one of the okay. first 10 amendments to the constitution. Okay, so in the criminal action, I'm guessing again, the case has not, commenced, I'm guessing that it will be argued, maybe not, it will not have the name qualified immunity, it will be argued by the defense representing uh, the police officer that he was acting in the line of duty, that, um, that the individual was resisting arrest, that the individual was potentially armed, all, all of those sorts of things. That's not, none of that's affected by again qualified immunity it's that's just right. a, it's a factual determination and 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 it, but in a way there's an element of that this which is a police officer who is discharging his duty responsibly nonetheless has the ability to use force against a a, a, a alleged or a, a, fel a felon or somebody who he believes has that he had probable cause to believe that this fellow had had committed a crime. 
correct? Right. So essentially, it's 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 the same type of argument, although it's 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 nonetheless different. There's a different burden of proof in a criminal proceeding. Um, um, so yeah, so it, it, it they can be parallel claims, but different burdens of proof uh, in a criminal case from a civil case. But where I've heard the qualified immunity thing, and I don't want to get you off the track, where I've heard the qualified immunity concept discussed is in the context of the police disciplining or not disciplining um, the police department, not disciplining their own member. And the police unions seem to come into this. And that's where I've heard the term qualified immunity raised. Is that a misapplication yeah. of that principle? Yeah, that's a little bit different. Uh, and it's different because many police uh, departments are what we call organized, they're represented by public unions. And so that def the words are batted about, uh, but it's, uh, it's a different concept. Uh, it arises, the claims and defenses for the police officers there arise under uh, the collective bargaining agreement. And let me just say, we, most, of this, most of the time this deals with police officers, but any agent of a state government or a municipality, maybe it's uh, an investigator for a state uh, department of uh, licensing. If they violate your constitutional rights, they're acting under what's called color of state law. You're using your badge. You know, a lot of people uh, have a badge. You know, if uh, uh, someone goes and they inspect a restaurant, right? They're a state agent. They have, they actually have badges. Uh, uh, probate officers. Uh, one of my students was a probate officer. And she wouldn't let me touch it, but she had a badge. She showed me her badge. So that's under color of state law. Okay, so let's get back to the main theme here about, you've already said that this qualified immunity concept was um, the subject of uh, Supreme Court rulings and other and rulings by other courts. And presumably the, the reasoning behind directing it was to say, we don't want police and other officials who are responsibly discharging their duties and responsibilities to be afraid of exercising appropriate action because of fear that they will have, you know, civil liability, massive legal uh, bills and, and pay massive fines. So we're just going to say there is a t there's a time and a place for qualified immunity. But then the, the way they, the courts explained it was, well, we're going to say you get qualified immunity provided that you didn't have notice. And what that has evolved in meaning is you, there wasn't another case around that would have instructed you. But it's a, that's exactly right. Well said. That's a great summary. Okay. But most um, professionals that are looking at this, well, I won't say most, a lot of folks have been saying, this does. This has gone too far. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and we need to, to quote revisit it. Um, I don't know whether the Supreme Court has a case pending. It might, which we should speak to, but I know that it's been talked about, and I know that there has been a, a bill in uh, the House of Representatives, uh, formerly called, um, I think, the Police Justice Act, but it renamed as the George. Floyd Justice and Policing Act that addresses this issue of qualified immunity. So why don't you pick it up from there? Sure. So let me talk on, on two levels here. Let me first go to the Supreme Court of the United States. So uh, last year, uh, several of these cases, in fact, uh, the case I, I spoke about where the child was shot in the leg, right? Shot right in the leg. Uh, that uh, uh, the lawyers in that case uh, sought the United States Supreme Court review and other uh, uh, there were some other cases. The Supreme Court said, we're not going to do it. They said in June of 2020, we're not going to look at it. But the Supreme Court is not unaware of this. In fact, Justice uh, Thomas, uh, Justice Gorsuch, uh, the late Justice Ginsburg, uh, Justice Sotomayor, they all want to relook at the whole doctrine of qualified immunity. Why? And I'll get to that in a second, because it's gone too far. And in November, just several months ago, November 2020, the Supreme Court looked at a case. It was a case arising here in Texas. And it was a, a person who was put into a prison cell. And he said he was there for several days. 
and there was human waste in his cell. It covered the walls. And the Fifth Circuit, which covers Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, said, you know what? And this is how the courts analyzed it. This was a constitutional violation. No question about it. Eighth Amendment, uh, uh, dealing with, it, with imprisonment um, and unfair punishment and cruel and unusual punishment. But you know what? This never happened before. So you cannot sue the warden. You cannot sue the, uh, the guards. And the Supreme okay. Court looked at this. They didn't hear any argument. They looked at it and they said, you know what? I'll, I'll just translate it for you. Some stuff is just obvious. Some stuff is just obvious. And these allegations, we don't care if it never happened before. This is so bad that if these facts prove to be true, this person's constitutional, constitutional rights were violated, regardless of it ever happened before. And, and those officers, the prison warden, the guards should be held individually liable in those circumstances. So the Supreme Court has taken a very hard look at this in these circumstances. And I think what they're doing is they're waiting to see where the Congress acts, which gets to the other point you raised. The House of Representatives uh, has passed a bill uh, eliminating qualified immunity as, the, as a defense. The Senate has a bill pending that keeps qualified immunity. And so there's a conflict coming, there'll be a uh, you know, conference committee, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happen, le happens legislatively. But I think the court, the high court, our court, the Supreme Court, has not yet looked at whether to keep qualified immunity because they want to see what Congress does. But you, you know, interestingly, you say that, uh, you know, obviously uh, the Senate at this point, while uh, there's a 50-50 split with a tie vote breaker. Um, the Senate, which still has a, you know, close to a par parity between Republicans and Democrats, they're not, they're not in favor of uh, doing anything to eliminate or modify uh, significantly qualified immunity. But you just mentioned a bunch of judges, some of whom uh, all, uh, were Trump appointees and some of whom uh, are, have been regarded as conservative as well as some liberal justices. So they, from a, from a legal standpoint, believe that this, uh, this concept of qualified immunity needs close scrutiny. It needs, that's right, it needs close scrutiny or, and this is where Justice uh, Barrett comes in, or maybe it needs to be eliminated. Because here's the thing, and it's very important. There's a concept called textualism. And that's sort of a fancy lawyer word that basically means this. And this is what Justice Barrett believes. Uh, she worked, she clerked for Justice, the late Justice Scalia. If the, if, a, if, a, if the statute doesn't contain a defense, for instance, if there's nothing literally in the statute about the defense of qualified immunity, then it doesn't exist. Who created it? The courts. If it's gonna be created, Congress should create it. So you look at the text of the statute that was passed back in 1871, and you can read it a hundred times, a thousand times, 10,000 times, and you know what? Qualified immunity, as you've pointed out, isn't there. And I think there could be a coalition of Justice Sotomayor, Justice, just, yeah, Barrett, Justice Barrett, Justice Gorsuch, uh, Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, to totally get rid of qualified immunity using a textualist analysis, which seems counterintuitive. But as you point out, some are very conservative, some are very liberal, but I think the court the high court can find common ground under a textual analysis. And as Justice Kagan, uh, she wrote an article, gave a speech a few years ago at Harvard. She said, we're all textualists now. And they're embracing this concept, they being the court. And so it's altogether possible. Well, I wanna get into um, a little bit later, um, the textualism because it brings up some other 
issues that um, folks have been talking about in terms of the Supreme Court justice, but it, it, there is a um, there is there is a controversy about whether textualism is a legitimate yep. way of interpreting the Constitution, mm -hmm. legitimate way of interpreting statutes. It has different resonance with the Constitution. But let's let's stay with um, this issue now of qualified immunity sure. again. Let my guest uh, Michael Malanka. Maslanka. Yeah, it's Maslanka. I've, Maslanka. I've said it fourteen times. That's all right. It's 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 Polish. Uh, it's, <laughs> no, it's Polish, and it's funny. My grandfather came from Poland. It means uh, buttermilk in Polish. Buttermilk. Okay. Yeah, it's pronounced Maslanka. He came here, worked in the steel mills, saved his money. You know what he did? He bought a dairy farm. So, <laughs> story. Of my grandfather, Michael Buttermilk Maslanka. Yeah, that's basically right. Assistant professor of law. Assistant professor of law <laughs> in Texas. Qualified immunity. Let the question that occurs to me from what you said again is, um, you you could get rid of it would seem to me qualified immunity, and you wouldn't necessarily be exposing police officers or other public officials to a situation where they were defenseless about an alleged act in which they went well beyond what was reasonable in their duty. They would still be able to raise the question that, look, the facts here were such, you know, we tried to get this guy, he was, he was resisting arrest, he pulled a knife, or he said he had a knife, or he looked like he had a pipe bomb or whatever. That, that would seem to me, as, from a reasonable person's standpoint, that that would be sufficient. You don't have to have immunity because immunity is different as you indicated than a defense. Immunity means unless these very particular circumstances exist, um, you know, you're, you're, the, the police officer walks off free. Is, would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, that's right because it, it's a two-step analysis. Now the first step analysis is, was a constitutional right violated? Yes or no? And uh, if the answer is uh, yes, that should be the end of the inquiry. But there's that subsidiary uh, deal of whether qualified immunity in that instance can be asserted. So there's that way of, uh, of looking at it. I think if the high court gets rid of qualified immunity, Congress will enact something to protect police officers because the court has been very sympathetic. Uh, to, it's called the concept of breathing room is that you can't hold police officers liable because for split second decisions that they have to make. Um, and so there would not be section 1983 liability when you have to make a decision, sometimes erroneous, sometimes an erroneous decision, but you have to make it in a split second. Uh, they're human beings, men and women uh, uh, trying to do their best. Um, and so I, I, I think that, that if qualified immunity disappeared tomorrow, uh, police officers or government agents could still mount an effective defense saying, this is what I had to do. You know, I had to have some breathing room here. I made a decision. Maybe in hindsight, it was the wrong decision. But as you point out, a reasonable person in my place, a reasonable police officer, maybe I should say, in my place would have made the same decision. We always don't make the right decisions. But I think as you pointed out, um, Congress might nonetheless, if qualified immunity from a judicial concept, because if, the, if, the, it's, if it's judges that created it, so judges ought to be able to relook at it and potentially take it away. Um, but if and, they do, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that that's exactly right. And I, I believe, that most police officers, most government agents want to do a good job. I, I understand that there's uh, discrimination and systemic racism in this country. There may be a debate about that, but, but, but I believe there is. Um, and, you know, as Hemingway wrote, in, uh, not Hemingway, but Faulkner, I'm going to misquote him really or paraphrase him. He said, the past isn't the past. The past isn't dead, right? It's still with us. I'll give you a quick example. You talk about shooting people in the back. A lot of people don't know this, but up until 1976, 
23 states, I think it was 23, had statutes that said a police officer could shoot someone in the back who they believed was a felon, who was fleeing the scene of a crime, even though they posed no danger to anyone. In the United States Supreme Court in 1976, a case called Tennessee versus Garner, struck those laws down. And they said that that is an unlawful search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment. Broad language. And they said that taking someone's life, sadly, is the ultimate seizure. So this concept is uh, of excessive force being used is not that ancient a concept. It wasn't until 76 that it was uh, gotten rid of. And a lot of police officers receive better training now. Those statutes went by the wayside. They were, they were, they were stricken. But do you bring up another point that um, seems relevant here? Or at least it reminds me of a point. Um, a lot of folks who are um, activists in terms of Black justice and Black civil rights, including Black Lives Matter, have suggested that what we have in this country as policing had its roots in um, pre, pre or post Civil War era of giving police the kind of military power, so to speak, um, uh, that that they exercised when they were rounding up quote uh, slaves that were fl fleeing or 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 whatever, and that that, that there's a oh, there's a whole problem here. And what that I'd like you to comment on that. But what that brings up to me is this. In a criminal action, such as the one in uh, involving uh, the police officer who uh, put his put his knee on the neck of George Floyd, uh, you know, to prove somebody guilty of a crime, you have to prove uh, show evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a very high bar, and the police can exercise, you know, can raise all the defenses as to why he, she, or did, the, the, did this. These civil actions are a way to create a further deterrent of abusive behavior on the part of police and other officials so that it's easier to get a, a, a holding in favor of, of a, in a civil case. And it's meant to say, look, we, we gotta give the victim of this some kind of ability to get redress. So. There's just something that seems, again seems out of whack here to me. Uh, so, yeah, there is a different burden of proof in a, in a criminal proceeding, which is a little out of my daily work, a little out of my, really out of my purview. Um, and there's a, there's a, still a civil proceeding um, that can uh, that can be brought. Um, so, so they they work in tandem with one another. Right. I mean, again, I don't want to take you off uh, what is in your bailiwick, but it, again, we have a, an issues about policing in this country that are front and center. We have people using rhetoric like defund the police, and we have people t talking about excessive force mm -hmm. and victimization. And we, you know, we have the arguments that there's a few bad apples, we shouldn't punish everybody and so on and so forth. And there's been questions raised about the extent to which police are behaving not in the most responsible way because they have the protection of the, the, the police unions. So to me, um, and again, I'm, not, I'm trying not to look at this issue of qualified immunity in a vacuum. I, I think that there are serious questions that need to be raised as to how policing should be effective and yet, you know, not excessive. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and, go ahead. So let me, let me make a couple of comments on that. Uh, first, um, there's no concept in the law, we call it respondeat superior. So just because a police officer, let's say a police officer does in fact violate a constitutional right, excessive force, what have you. The city is not responsible immediately, right? There has to be proof that the city knew there was a danger, that something bad would happen um, and ignored the danger. 
uh, there was a, a case uh, out of New England where the city council, yeah, it was a city council. There was a essentially no knock warrant. Um, and the uh, city council, they sort of knew, they knew that the police did this sort of stuff. Uh, and they took no action. They were had an ostrich-like attitude of self-delusion. In those instances, they took no action to stop these constitutional violations. Uh, by the same token, uh, sometimes, as was the case in Ohio, uh, Supreme went to the Supreme Court, where there's no training, there's a lack of training to stop these constitutional violations from occurring. Only though in those circumstances, only though in those circumstances can the city, the state, the county be held responsible and have to write a check. So it's not automatic liability to the entities that have the money. Uh, that's the first point I would make. The second point I would make is, and the one thing about programs like this and the privilege of speaking on a program like this is we educate the public uh, on their rights. Um, um, and uh, so I would, I, would simply, I would simply make the, those two points. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not an expert in policing. Uh, I, I've represented police departments and other matters, uh, but uh, I, would, I would make those, uh, those two points. Is if somebody listens to this and they're better educated. And, oh, and the third point I would make is simply this, is that other courts have said, you know what, this is going too far in qualified immunity. So uh, one court uh, in the West uh, uh, says, you know what, this it's gotta have happened before is too strict, too strict. We're gonna have the concept of fair notice. Was there fair notice? The Supreme Court in November in that case said, you know, some stuff is just obvious. And there's a recent case out of the Fourth Circuit which covers Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, where a suspect uh, was supposedly uh, under total under restraint. Uh, one of the police, but there was a conflict in evidence. Well, the police said, you know what? We felt a knife uh, on his body uh, and his arm was still mobile. Uh, and therefore we were afraid and we shot him. They shot him 33 times according to the court's opinion, according to the record. Uh, and this, the guy died and the estate of the guy suing said, you know what? He was totally incapacitated. He was a harm to no one. And, and the Court of Appeals judge said, we know police have to make split second decisions, but we just can't allow qualified immunity to be a rubber stamp. You just don't come in and say qualified immunity and get it stamped like you know, your passport. There's an issue here. Were they police in danger? Was he incapacitated? And we're not gonna dismiss this case under qualified immunity. We're gonna let the jury decide. And what that comes down to is something I think very important because when you let the jury and the community decide, they then decide the norms in their community. They then decide policing in their community. And so you have the public, the citizens, having input into policing and responsibility, um, assuming there's a constitutional violation in the first place. So qualified immunity may be abolished or it may be modified in such a way that it is not a rubber stamp, that it is something that considers the various factors that you so well articulated about split second decision-making being on the spot. Police officers do a wonderful job of making those split second decisions. Uh, and they need, as the Supreme Court has said, uh, and that's, it's, it's their words, not mine, quote, breathing room, end quote. Well, let me ask you a, another question. Um, and you may not have enough knowledge, uh, information about this. In we mentioned earlier again that the, the city of uh, Minneapolis, I believe. Um, did I have that right? Yeah, Minneapolis. Minneapolis um, uh, agreed to pay a, a huge sum of money. Um, we don't have it. We don't know whether there was a court case filed or whether they were anticipating a court case. 
we don't know whether it would have been a violation of 1983 or civil rights or whether or whatever, but evidently the, the city didn't just make a gift. They felt exposed to redress this particular uh, situation on a civil side by making a huge amount of money available to the George Floyd family. Do you think, and I don't know whether this enters into the qualified immunity uh, as to how that's handled by the courts, but it, it's evident that this particular police officer had had 17 other instances of quote, misconduct. Not, not, not sure if it's come out what those instances were and were they related, but would that go towards basically uh, not in, even under a qualified immunity doctrine, not entitling that police officer to immunity, not because they didn't have fair notice because there was not another case, but he was put on notice that his actions in these prior incidents showed a excessive use of force. So I think that would depend. And I don't know, uh, Minneapolis is in Minnesota and that's in a, what's called the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. So I don't know what the standard uh, for determining qualified immunity is in the Eighth Circuit. I think in some courts um, uh, in this country, that would be sufficient notice. In other courts, like we're here in Texas, in the fifth, what's called the Fifth Circuit, uh, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, if it didn't happen before, right? It, 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 it's, it doesn't exist. You're not on fair notice, no matter how similar, how similar your current conduct that's being challenged is to your prior conduct. Is, it's very strict here, extremely strict. So a lot of it depends. Uh, and so when you, that, and that's one reason why the Supreme Court needs to look at this is whether they get rid of qualified immunity or not is just as varies now. If something bad happens to you and your constitutional rights are violated in Texas and you violate the same facts happen in Massachusetts or Oregon, they're in different jurisdictions. The result is different. So it's, it, there needs to be some harmonizing of the law of qualified immunity, because right now it's unequal justice, depending on the happenstance of where you live, not the conduct that is being challenged. Well, um, let's um, move on. Um, you started a discussion, uh, or at least uh, we weighed in on textualism and the way you raised that earlier in the discussion was the jurists on the Supreme Court who purport to be textualists and that's I don't know if it's a majority but it's something more than uh, two, two or three there's probably at least four or five justices or four justices who have been declared as being declared their intentions or their views as being textualists do you have um, an opinion about whether textualism is even a proper way of making determinations about uh, a 250-year-old constitution, a little, you know, or or a statute in particular? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you argue that. I talk about that in my new book, "Experiencing Employment Discrimination," uh, from West Academic, which is in Minneapolis. Uh, and actually, I'm teaching that now uh, uh, here at the school. One of the things I teach at the school is textualism. It, it can have it. It can it can have results that surprise people. I'll give you an example from June of 2020. Right, the Supreme Court of the United States is looking at whether sexual orientation discrimination is prohibited under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That law prohibits discrimination based on race, on color, on religion, on national origin, and on sex. Sex, and put, sex as in gender, correct? Sex as in gender, right. Okay. okay. And I promise you, back in 1964, back in 1964, being gay was a crime in many parts of this country. Congress had no idea or belief that sexual orientation would ever be covered. A protected so class. Protected class, exactly. 
So a clever argument came up is that what does the statute actually say? Let's not look at the legislative history. Let's not look at anything. It says you shall not discriminate because of sex. So the argument was, let's say someone's gay. And this actually was a case. Somebody's gay. Uh, he's married uh, to, a, to another man. And his boss gives him a hard time, ridicules him, a hostile environment about you know, gay sexual activity or gay marriage. Well, if that guy was a woman, he would not undergo that harassment. Why is he undergoing that harassment? Because he's a man. That's because of sex. In a purely textual analysis, the Supreme Court decision last June was not about the freedom of individuals. It was about a textual analysis. You look at the text and only the text. I'll give you the same example that in June of 2020, there was a transgender case. Someone was transgendering from being a, um, um, I, th I think a man to a, 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 to a woman, male to female. And the Supreme Court said, why were they fired? And they were fired because of their sex, because they were changing sex. Same thing, you, if you're a Christian and you become a Buddhist and the employer doesn't like that and they fire you, you're fired because of your religion. So this concept of textualism can be very liberating when you get to the result that you want to get to. So a lot of the stuff about Justice Barrett, um, I wrote an article about this. Oh, it's a, the sky's falling, it's gonna be terrible. She's a textualist. And the majority of the Supreme Court is a text, uh, believe in textualism. And we'll have some very unusual results because it's not about conservative versus liberal. It's about textualism. So a lot of times you look at the legislative history or social history. But the Supreme Court now says if it's in the law, it's in the law. If it's not, it's not, period, end of story. It's a fascinating area. It surprises you. It really does. Well, but just, of, Justice Scalia, just late Justice Scalia was the champion. Well, it sounds like it's like a flip of the coin as to whether um, judicial opinions based on textualism come out in a way that seems to favor a progressive, shall we say, viewpoint, such as in the case you mentioned about uh, sex. And I, th I think that was Justice Gorsuch who surprised everyone by basically saying, do I have that right? Yeah, it was Justice Gorsuch, but it wasn't a surprise to me. No, it wasn't a surprise to you. No, no it, really, it was a surprise to many people. But I listened to the arguments, right? I listened to the arguments and he kept going back to what does the statute say? It was somewhat, it was bloodless, right? It wasn't about human dignity and liberty, but that's how he got to where he got to. Yeah, no, but it surprised a lot of people. A lot of people were shocked. Well, how, how could someone appointed by President Trump come up with this? Right, come up with something that could possibly be beneficial to, to, individuals. <laughs> to individuals, particularly gay individuals. He wouldn't, yeah. have, he would, he wouldn't have done that, but we know that, you know, uh, Ex-President Trump was not exactly a student of, of constitutional law, and um, and 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 so he's been disappointed, but by a, a number of things, including I think a, a stance taken by um, Amy Coney Barrett, probably in one of the uh, election cases. But I guess the the, the term textualism, I, I had not heard that terminology used. Uh, throughout law school and my practice, it seems to have come up um, rather recently in terms of the use of that term. I think it used to be more often referred to as a literal interpretation. Yeah. And it used to be judges were criticized by um, Republicans and other people on the right who quote legislated as opposed to simply you know, taking the words yeah. as written. Yeah. And but now it seems that there's new life in this concept of textualism that make it to, to try perhaps to make it more respectable. It's more respectable if you don't if you just look at the words on the on the paper, but according to some people's analysis. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I will say this is, 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 is we call it textualism now, but you're absolutely right. So back in the 1970s, uh, there was a case, of course, remember Civil Rights Act 1964, uh, no discrimination because of race. Uh, case goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, Justice Marshall actually writes the opinion. Uh, and the argument is, is that blacks are the ones be, to be protected by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Justice Marshall used textualism. I think you're right, he called it sort of a literal approach. Well, it says because of race. Now, he could have stopped there, but he didn't. I mean, races includes people who are white, people who are Asian. He didn't stop there. He went into the legislative histories of why Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If that issue came up today, they would stop right with the language of the statute they wouldn't go into the legislative history. The legislative history doesn't make it into the law's words itself. It's just so much fluff. That's the way the high court looks at it. It's a little more technical than that, but when you translate it down to everyday language, <laughs> that's exactly what textualism is. Well, we're probably we probably should do another show um, dealing strictly with this concept of textualism and literalism as it pertains to uh, both the Constitution and statutes. My concern about it, or just from a philosophical standpoint, I don't have a partisan point of view, is I get that the statute should be interpreted as written. You can look at the comments that were made to help to influence your evaluation. But if Congress wants to have a law that pertains to this far, but the statute was not drafted that broadly, then Congress is stuck with that result, it seems to me. But it seems to me different, and maybe you have a viewpoint and we don't have much time left. In the Constitution, again, we're talking about a, a, a document that's over 200 years old it uses language and words that people don't use in that same way today. So it seems to me like it's less appropriate, but we just have a minute or two. Or two I, I would just say this, and it kind of goes back to where we started. It goes back to Tennessee versus Garner, right? The Fourth Amendment talks about unlawful searches and seizures. Even a purely textual analysis of seizure would include taking someone's life. You don't have to go any further than that. That is a seizure. And so, again, I, I, I have my own personal opinions. I, I don't teach them in, in, in class. Um, I, I, but I mean, I will tell you my personal opinions. I think, I, think, I think textualism is a little dry. It's a little bloodless. It can lead to consequences that are not just. Uh, I think that legislative history is crucial. Uh, but I think what we're going to find are laws now that are written, uh, both in, in federal and in state practice as well, that are much more detailed and much more specific, which is sort of contrary to the way our Constitution is written and to what, the way many of our laws are written, which are broad. But sometimes even if it's broad, unlawful search and seizure, it, purely textual analysis would include, you don't have to say murder, right? You don't have to say we're, we're, we're going to leave it there. Michael Mislanka, thank you for being on the show today, professor of law in Texas. And uh, thank you for that. And we'll have you back to discuss many of the other topics that we alluded to today. Thanks thank so much. you. It's, it's been a privilege as always, Mark. Thank you.